Hi, thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about cryptography and historical cryptography specifically. Now cryptography, big word, it comes from the Greek cryptos and graphene. Cryptos meaning hidden and graphene meaning writing, so hidden writing. Now most people, when they think of cryptography are going to think of things like this, like military cryptography, uh, or they're going to think about uh, diplomatic ciphers. And um, I'm you know, here you see some diplomatic ciphers where they would write some things in regular text and what's called clear text. And then they would, when they got to the juicy bits, they switch things over to numbers. So I got interested in cryptography. I've always been interested in puzzles, but I got interested in the public cryptography scene when I heard about this code called the Freaknik 3 code. And it had been released at a convention in 1999 as a challenge to the attendees at the conference, but they hadn't been able to crack it. And it had been a year and I heard about it at another convention called Dragon Con in 2000, and I got interested and I cracked it. And then I went around cracking a bunch of other codes and I found myself getting invited all over the place to speak on cryptography. And people were asking me, how are you so good at this? And, and it, I, I don't know exactly. I never had formal training in cryptography. Uh, I do come from a long line of mathematicians. I love puzzles. And I'm the kind of person, I'm tenacious. When I get a hold of something, a challenge, I just kind of grab onto it and I won't let go. So I, I think those kind of things help. So I'm invited to speak at you know, universities and different agencies. And then I got invited to be on the board of directors of the United States National Cryptologic Museum. And this is a, an artist rendition that we're seeing here of the new museum. And I actually put together a team so we've designed codes to go into the walls of the museum. So students who are visiting the museum can try their hand at, at these codes as they come in or go out on their lunch break. So let's go back to history a bit and we'll talk about the Kama Sutra. Now, most people, when they think about the Kama Sutra are not going to think about cryptography, but, it, but it's there. So we don't know exactly how old the Kama Sutra is, but let's say it's around the year 200 CE, the common era. And one of the chapters of the Kama Sutra talks about arts and sciences for people to study, both women and men, with the theory that if you study these, you'll become more attractive and also more resourceful. And of these 64 arts and sciences, number 44 is the art of understanding writing in cipher and the writing of words in a peculiar way. So here we have something 2000 years old that talks about ciphers. And we also have other examples that go several hundred years earlier than that, and perhaps even a thousand years earlier. So in the 17th century, we have something, one of the more popular types of cipher systems. It's called the Baconian cipher because it was designed by Sir Francis Bacon, so Baconian. And he, he was really interested in so many different things. And one of the things was cryptography. He actually designed a system which is called a biliteral alphabet. So on the left, you can see that every letter of the alphabet, he has come up with a way of representing it with a series of five characters, A's and B's, again, a biliteral alphabet. Now he did not use the letters J or U. So on the right-hand side, we have the modern version of the Baconian cipher, which does include the 26 letters in the modern alphabet. So one way that this was used, a fun way, was in 1918, this was the graduating class of the first group of United States World War I code breakers. And the, the people at the bottom there, two of them, they were very young. There was a young married couple, Elizabeth and William Friedman. Elizabeth had actually taught William about codes and they were cryptographic geniuses and they were asked to put together this class. And if you look at the way people are standing, you'll see that some of them are facing forward and some are facing to the side. So forward side, forward side, or side side forward. So again, we have these A's and B's and it decrypts with the Baconian system to the phrase knowledge is power. So another group of people that were very interested in cryptography were musicians and composers. The most famous of these was Johann Sebastian Bach. And he would put this, it's called the Bach motif, these letters that represented his name, the ACH. And he was the most famous to do it, but many others did it. Members of his family did it, who also had the name Bach. Other 
composers might just put their initials or just portions of their name. It was just a fun way of doing it, of hiding their name inside the pieces that they were composing. Another composer who was famous for cryptography was Edward Elgar, a very famous composer in England. And he also wrote a piece called The Enigma Variations, where he had different things that were kind of hidden musical sketches referring to his friends. And he said that there was another deeper secret, which people still today debate, what is this inner secret? It's been a hundred years now. So, but one of the things that he's most famous for in the cryptography scene is this thing called the Dora Bella Cipher, which he wrote in 1897. It was just a little note that he had tucked in with an envelope that was a thank you note to her family for staying, uh, his family got to stay with them for a vacation. And she was never able to crack it. And after he passed away in 1934, she wrote a book about him and, and her experiences of what it, was, what it was like to be with him while he was composing things over the years. And the book was called Edward Elgar, Memories of a Variation. And in the book, she had, as she was researching, she had gone through her papers and found this note again. So she published it in the book and said, perhaps someone else can crack this cipher but no one had. And it's, so it's been, again, over a hundred years and no one has been able to crack the cipher. So maybe someone watching this TED talk might have an idea on how to crack the cipher. And then you will have credit for cracking one of the most famous <laughs> unsolved codes in the world. So another group of people uh, that would use ciphers would be the Freemasons. And they tended to use this system. It could be many different types of grids and Xs. And they would use this for secret correspondence between their various lodges. Also, they would use it for other purposes. For example, George Washington, he would use a Freemason cipher with a, a scrambled alphabet when he was a general in, in the uh, army in the American Revolutionary War. So it was, it was just something that they used. Now, they did not invent it, but they probably used it more often than anyone else did. So it's typically called the Freemason cipher, sometimes called the pig pen cipher or, or other things. And these are a couple tombstones we see of Freemasons. So you can see they would actually carve these Freemason ciphers actually into the stone sometimes. Other secret societies would also have to come up with ways of communicating. They wouldn't want, so this is a book that was published by one of these societies and they're trying to figure out how can they publish information about their secret ceremonies where it stays secret. So they would, they scramble and come up with ways they would remove vowels or move consonants around. It was, uh, you, you can find several books like that that look like encrypted text. Another group of things that were often encrypted would be diaries. People would come up with ways of encrypting their diaries. This is the one of Beatrix Potter. She wrote the tale of Peter Rabbit and other tales. And when she was 14 years old, she came up with this system of, it, the, it's what we would call a, a monoalphabetic substitution cipher. And she wrote hundreds of pages over many years in the cipher. Now, most diaries that are encrypted would use this kind of system that would be a, what we call fairly simple because you really kind of have to memorize this as you're writing so that you don't have to think about each letter as you're encrypting it. You don't want a very complex system, but there are exceptions. For example, this is the diary of Donald Hill. He was a British pilot and a Japanese prisoner of war in Hong Kong during World War II. And he kept an encrypted diary where it looked like multiplication tables. And he did this so that it wouldn't be confiscated and taken away from him. And it's these kinds of encrypted diaries give us a wonderful lens into the past where we can see things like what was it like to have been a prisoner of war during this time? And perhaps they were writing about things that they really couldn't talk about in the society at that time. So it's just a wonderful way of learning more about history. Another set of things that would often be encrypted would be postcards. Now, postcards by their nature are a very public medium. They're not in an envelope. They're passing through the hands of the postman and the members of your family. And people who are writing postcards often didn't write, didn't want all these other people reading what they were writing. So they would come up with codes and ciphers, a way of encrypting things. You can see the ones on the right are using 
there we go, the Freemason cipher. It's very popular, even for those people who are not Freemasons. Another way of sending messages would be telegrams. They would use different systems. So on the left, we have, this is a 1939 telegram using something called a Caesar cipher, which was, yes, used by Julius Caesar. We have a fairly simple system where each letter is just shifted by three in the alphabet. On the right, we have something very different. This is something that astronomers would use. And this was a telegram sent in 1896. Astronomers had a challenge in that often they're trying to use, they're trying to send very detailed numerical data. And so if a telegram operator might accidentally make a typo and type 208 when they meant to type 207 or transcribe 56 as 65, that could be a big deal if they're trying to communicate the location of a comet. So they had entire code books printed that where you could take a four digit number or a five digit number and convert it into a number and convert it into a word. And then the words would be there in the telegram, much more resistant to typographical errors. And then when the telegram was received, the person, the other astronomer would look at these words, pull out their code book, convert the words back to numbers, and then they would have the exact date and time and location of the comet that was being communicated. Another group of people that would use uh, cryptography then and now were fiction authors. So here we have at the top, we have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes, The Adventure of the Dancing Men. So each little character of a man there is representing a different letter in the alphabet by the way that the man is, is holding up their arms and their legs are positioned. So now I'm gonna talk about another one. This is one that's very close to my heart. I've spent a lot of time on it. This is one at a CIA headquarters in Washington, DC. So here we have an overhead view of the Central Intelligence Agency. Dun, dun, dun. And on the right, we are seeing the original headquarters building. On the left, we're seeing they, they built a new headquarters building, that <clears throat> white building with the funny shaped roof, that's the cafeteria. And to the left of the cafeteria, we have a landscaped area. And in that area is this sculpture called Cryptos. Again, Cryptos is Greek for hidden. And when they built their new headquarters building, they also commissioned art and sculpture to be put around the building. And this is one of the pieces of art. It has about 2000 characters in it. And there's at least four codes. Three of the codes have been solved at this point. It's been 30 years. The fourth code has not been solved yet. And it's one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail of what, you, what each part says, but I assume after this, uh, many of you will be watching this on the internet and you can pause the video and read more about these different parts. Some of them used a substitution system called Visionaire. One part used a transposition system. And then there's part four. <clears throat> I can't tell you, we don't know. Now the artist, Jim Sanborn, did give some clues about it. For example, in 2010, he said that the word Berlin was at a certain location. And then he gave us the word clock. And then in January, 2020, he gave us the word Northeast. And then the pandemic started. So he said, okay, I'm gonna give them another clue, which is again, the word East at a different location. So here we have a bunch of plain text of the cipher. <laughs> and we still can't solve the rest of it. So again, maybe someone who's watching this may be able to figure it out. That would be awesome. So cryptos is used in other things I mentioned about fiction. So here we have the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown and hidden in the artwork of the book, of the book jacket here, Dan Brown had hidden five puzzles and two of them refer to cryptos. So here on the back of the book in that brown tear area, you can see the phrase only WW knows. And also on the back of the book, really faint, light red on dark red, you can see latitude and longitude coordinates. So both of these are referring to the crypto sculpture and they're giving hints that his next book was going to be taking place in Washington DC and would have cryptos in it. Well, Dan Brown actually called me up on the phone because I was somewhat of an authority on cryptos and he asked, can I ask you some questions about cryptos for, as research for my next book? And I said, well, sure. And so we had a few conversations and, and I helped him with that and some other things. And then I was really surprised and delighted to find out that in the sequel, he actually named a character after me. So Nola K, there is a scrambled form of Ilanka. So other people were also inspired by the codes in Dan Brown's books. For example, he was actually sued by some people who were claiming that he had 
infringe their copyright for their book, The Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Now, they were not successful with their lawsuit, but the lawsuit in England, the judge was actually captivated by codes as well. And so he hid a code in the judgment when he wrote it. So we have these letters here that are, are slightly italicized and bold. So if you go through the entire judgment and decrypt things, you will find the message, Smithy Code, Jackie Fisher, who are you, Dreadnought? So this is because the judge was a huge fan of Admiral Jackie Fisher, who had lived a hundred years earlier. And also the launch of the first big British battleship called the Dreadnought, which had been launched exactly 100 years before the trial in 1906. So the judge kind of wanted to commemorate that by hiding this code in, in the judgment. So who uses classical ciphers today? Well, prisoners will often use these things. They'll be trying to send messages out of prisons. And of course, these messages get uh, immediately intercepted by the wardens and, and typically decrypted. Also, though, uh, prisoners of war will use these. For example, in Vietnam, the prisoners of war, uh, when they were in, in prison, would come up with this thing called the TAP code. So you see the letter L there. It's in the third row. It's in the first column. So the TAP code for that would be... Right? And so then you could use that TAP code for all the different letters of the alphabet and communicate. You could communicate between the cells, or if you were outside, maybe if you were sitting next to another prisoner, you could tap them on the arm, or even raking leaves, they could use this pattern to communicate. And it wasn't just the Vietnam War prisoners, other prisoners, the Russian prisoners of the SARS would use the same system, but it of course was the Cyrillic alphabet. And there's many other prisoners that would use the system, this tap code, or sometimes called the knock code. Uh, and it was based, they didn't invent it, it was based on a very old system called the Greek Polybius Square. So who else uses classical ciphers? Well, other criminals would when they're planning things and smuggling. And again, if, if uh, law enforcement can get their hands on these things, they're generally cracked fairly quickly. Um, authors will use these, if we, as we have spoken about. Game designers still use classical ciphers, puzzle designers, because there's just a lot of fun with these particular challenges. So most ciphers today, these classical historical ciphers are used for recreation or educational tools or for contests and art. And by the way, that little asterisk when I say educational tools, if you look at the books behind me, I have a code hidden in the books. So if you come back later and you look at the picture that's on this slide, it has everything you need. Uh, and you won't need to actually read what's on the book jackets, but maybe the shape of the books. Is it, okay, there's a hint for you. I won't say any more than that. So I think I'll finish by uh, asking a question. If, if you were going to encrypt a message today, what kind of message would you like it to be and why? Thank you.